Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this week's video, we're taking a look at presbyopia and what it should mean to you as an optician. Hey, I'm Sean Lassar from ModernOptician.com, where we help student opticians achieve their goals through books, study guides, and online videos just like this one. So if you've seen value in this video, make sure to smash the like button, subscribe, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any videos as they drop every week. Now let's jump into this presentation about presbyopia. All right, here we are in the presentation. So in the last couple of weeks, we've covered normal vision, we've covered myopia, hyperopia, and astigmatism. So now we're gonna move on to presbyopia. And this is a little bit unique compared to the others because whereas the others are kind of individually based, some patients will be myopic, some will be hyperopic, some will have astigmatism. Not everybody has these refractive errors. Presbyopia is unique in a sense that it affects absolutely everybody. Now, what we're gonna see in this lecture is that depending on the other refractive errors they have, the impact may be a little bit different. However, important to remember that every single patient does become presbyopic at some point. So why don't we jump into the lecture and start taking a look at uh, what the nuances are. And of course, before we get started, if you do want to dig a little bit deeper on these concepts or any of the others in preparation for your optician exams, make sure to check out the study guides for apprentice opticians available on Amazon and on modernoptician.com filled with study guides and workbooks and question banks and everything you need to make sure you succeed in your studies. All right, let's jump into the lecture. All right, so sticking with the theme that we've kind of covered over the last few lectures on refractive error, we are going to take a look at presbyopia simplified in the sense of what it is we should know on a very basic realm. And then we're going to dig a little bit deeper as the slides go on. So you see here the gentleman, you know, struggling with his phone. Uh, this is the main symptom of presbyopia that most people know. Difficulty with near vision. And it tends to begin around the age of 40 for most people. Not necessarily symptomatic at the age of 40, but the process does begin and it tends to get worse and worse as time goes on. It does affect myopia differently than hyperopia. So your myopic patients will definitely get a different experience of presbyopia than the hyperopic ones will. And uh, it's all due to the reduced accommodative ability of the eye. So accommodation is very strong in youth and it begins to decline as time goes on. And we're definitely gonna dig a little bit deeper into that. So this is kind of your layman explanation of presbyopia, but of course, as opticians, we wanna make sure that we have a much deeper grasp on this. So why don't we start digging into it a little bit deeper? So in order to really understand what's going on with presbyopia, it's super important to have a pretty good grasp on accommodation and exactly what the mechanism is and what's going on and why it is that eventually accommodation starts to fail later in life. So if we take a look at this diagram here, we have kind of a representation of a relaxed crystalline lens versus an accommodated one. So you'll see here that in the relaxed state, the crystalline lens has a little bit less of an oblong shape, and this is due to the relaxing of the ciliary muscle, and essentially will increase the tension on the zonual fibers uh, attached to the lens, and this actually will make it a little more taut and will give it less of a convex shape. So this is essentially where all your plus power is coming from in the crystalline lens, and you're gonna notice that by having a less convex shape that it's actually contributing less plus power to the whole equation of vision, just like we talked about in normal vision and in the other refractive errors as well. However, on the accommodated side, uh, when a patient is looking at a near object, things change a little bit. So the ciliary muscle contracts and this actually loosens off the, the zonal fibers a little bit and actually allows the lens to become a little bit more oblong. This actually increases the plus power and allows us to uh, you know, increase the converging power of the eye for that near object. Now this is happening all the time. It's an involuntary reflex and it's, uh, it's happening every single time we change focal length or, or change focus from a distance object to a near object. And it's very much what's responsible for our near vision. However, 
this ability starts to decline over time. So we discuss the the ability, the eye's ability to do this in the terms of its amplitude. So the amplitude of accommodation refers to its ability to have that increased strength. And you're going to notice here that if you look in the table, at the age of 10 years old, the amplitude of accommodation is 14. That means that theoretically, the crystalline lens can contribute up to 14 diopters of power to this overall equation. That's extremely, extremely strong. Uh, but you'll notice that in every decade of life, as we go down, that ability starts to decrease to the point where at 70 years old, the amplitude of accommodation is less than one diopter. So this is due to the hardening of the crystalline lens. Eventually, tissue, any, tissue in the body will always start to change as, uh, as time goes on. Well, the crystalline lens is extremely elastic and extremely flexible uh, early in age. However, as time starts to go on, we lose that elasticity. And eventually, even though the mechanism remains the same, the ciliary muscle doesn't necessarily get weaker and the zonal fibers don't change. However, the impact on the lens does change. So this is an important graphic to keep in mind. It's not necessarily something you're going to be tested on saying, you know, what is the amplitude of accommodation uh, for a patient at a particular age. However, you do have to understand that even in youth, the amplitude of accommodation starts to decrease. This is actually particularly uh, interesting when you think of hyperopic patients in the sense that we talked about how hyperopia has a, uh, well, the crystalline lens has the ability to mask hyperopia. So in this case, you also have to keep in mind that this masking ability will also decrease over time. So why don't we jump into the next slide and take a look at what all of this kind of means to vision. All right, so now that we've discussed accommodation and kind of what presbyopia does to accommodation, let's take a look at the mechanism or the optics behind this refractive error and see exactly what's going on. So most graphics you're going to see in this, you know, on this subject normally will show the impact on near vision. We're going to we're going to dig a little bit deeper in the future slides to show that it also has an effect on um, distance vision for some patients. However, in the you know layman kind of explanation here, you'll see that normal vision, just like here you have a near object, rays of light diverge outwards, and the eye is now responsible for converging those rays of light onto the retina. Uh, it does so through accommodation. So we see that the shape of the crystalline lens is going to change here, and it's going to add extra converging power. We talked about earlier in the previous slide that it can add up to 14 diopters in a child. Uh, not necessarily going to be responsible for 14 diopters in this particular case. Most near convergence uh, can be accomplished through about a plus 250 for you know something about 40 centimeters away. However, you'll see that you know children have lots and lots in reserve. But this is kind of the mechanism, the normal mechanism of near accommodation. However, in presbyopia, you'll notice that the graphic does a pretty good job of showing that even though we still have the same situation, we have a near object here, the crystalline lens can no longer contribute any accommodative power. So basically, the lens now becomes static, just like the cornea, right? We talked about how the different refractive elements of the eye, uh, the thing that keep, that's unique between the cornea and the crystalline lens is that the cornea is always static. It's always, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 diopters. And the crystalline lens is normally 20 to, well, you know, it could be to 34 uh, if it's full accommodation. However, in this particular case, it loses this ability so it can no longer add more and we're stuck with the 20 and we can no longer converge rays of light to the retina. And this actually, you know, very much resembles a hyperopic patient. But in this case, it's in the uh, near realm where they're trying to con where they're trying to converge light rays from a near object. So, of course, the solution here has to be correction. So in this case, if we were to kind of say that this example was a 40 centimeter object, we know and we know based on the uh, equation that your the amount of power required is usually the reciprocal of that. So that actually equals 2.5. So in this case, this lens, we can assume in this particular case is about plus 250. And then that power can now take the place of accommodation and bring the rays of light 
onto the retina. This is the basic principle of presbyopia. Now, of course, in this particular case, we haven't actually taken into consideration any other refractive error. We're pretty much assuming that this is an emetropic eye, that this is normal vision. And we know, you know, from our studies and from our, our experience in the dispensary that this is not always the case. It's actually rarely the case. So in the future slides, let's take a look at how we handle patients who are presbyopic but also have other refractive errors at play. All right, so there's a whole lot going on on this slide. So bear with me here. We're going to go through each individual patient, let's say, uh, and we're going to take a look at the impact of presbyopia on both their distance vision and their near vision. And we'll talk a little bit about what you know we likely going to have to do or the type of recommendations that we're likely going to have to make uh, based on those individual circumstances. So if we look first here on the first series of the emetropic patient, we kind of did this in the previous slide. You'll see that we have the distance uh, eye over here and we have the near vision eye over here. So and bear with me with these lines because it's kind of hard to aim on these things sometimes. However, distance vision uh, in the emetropic patient, we actually, Presbyopia should not have an impact. We should be able to converge rays of light onto the retina and get normal vision. So the emetropic patient, even though they're presbyopic, should not have a negative experience when uh, it comes to their distance vision. However, near vision, just like we did in the previous slide, the converging power of the eye is no longer strong enough to bring rays of light to focus on the retina, and we end up with a image form behind and now we no longer see well up close and that's you know looking back or thinking back of the first image on one of the first slides of the elderly gentleman trying to read his phone this is that situation uh, of course correction is going to be required and we have some options and we'll discuss it in the next slide as far as what we could do and it's not necessarily what we should do it's just what you can do because you do have options you can fit this person with a single vision reader uh, you know in that case because they don't necessarily have any distance requirement or for convenience you can fit them with some form of multifocal something we'll discuss a little bit more into detail in the next slide how about we take a look at the myopic patient here so the myopic patient is going to have distance issues right because we know that myopia is going to have a negative impact we know that the converging power of the eye is too strong that is a horrible line my apologies however just for our sake here we kind of get it that it's not working out here uh, as far as converging rays of light onto the retina and of course we end up correcting this with a minus lens for distance however the unique thing about the myopic patient is that and again if you if you haven't watched the lecture on myopia please do so you will you'll remember that the reason we call myopic patients nearsighted patients is because they're the optics of their eye is actually the pretty well suited to near objects. So in, I always use this example because I think it's pretty nice to, um, to demonstrate. Let's say this is a minus 250 myope. Well, we know that just from the previous slide, we know that minus 250 is a perfect uh, refractive situation for about 40 centimeters away. So let's just say this patient was a minus 250. Well, at 40 centimeters away, the optics of the eye are actually perfect to converge rays of light onto the retina. So in this particular case, the patient is going to have a negative experience in the distance, uncorrected of course, and then up close, they're gonna see well. So what do you do with this patient? Well, again, there are options. Assuming that a minus 250 patient will be corrected in the distance, uh, when they look through their glasses, they would still require accommodative power in order to converge rays of light. So in that particular case, they will not see well. They'll have the same experience as the emetropic patient because essentially when the patient's corrected, they kind of become emetropic in that scenario just with the addition of lenses. However, the unique thing here is that if they remove their glasses, they regain that perfect situation for 40 centimeters. So this patient is able to see well with, let's say, single vision distance correction and then remove their glasses and see well up close. Very important concept to understand here when you're discussing with patients because a lot of they don't understand these concepts the way you do. And they may be kind of thrown off if you start assuming that they don't see well up close when they really do. So this is something that you should always keep in mind that a presbyopic myope will actually probably not have that negative of an experience up close uncorrected. Now, of course, 
this patient is still a candidate for a multifocal because if they're not willing to take their glasses off every time they read, uh, some form of multifocal lens will be required. And finally, let's take a look at hyperopia, which is the type of patient that is most impacted by presbyopia and let's take a look why. So in this particular case we know that the optics of the eye are not well suited to converge rays onto the retina, they converge behind. Now in normal accommodative states this would be rectified. Uh, you know we talked about masking of hyperopia in the hyperopia uh, lecture. Most hyperopes, most young hyperopes to a certain degree of course will be able to mask this and not have a negative visual experience. However, in presbyopia, all of a sudden, we've lost this accommodative ability and now the vision will be blurred in a distance. And I talked about this in the, hyperop in the hyperopia lecture that even though we get, you know, we call hyperopia farsightedness and we get used to assuming that hyperopes see well in the distance, a plus 250 will be just as blurry as the minus 250 in the myopic situation when absolutely no uh, accommodation is at play. So let's say you have a post cataract patient, pseudo phacic, they've had a lens implant, that lens doesn't flex and doesn't change focal power. Therefore, a plus 250 hyperope, whereas they may have seen well most of their life, all of a sudden can't see distance anymore. So this is something you really have to look out for your hyperopic presbyopes. And of course, in near vision, it's far worse. They end up with even worse because now they're behind the eight ball. Let's say the same situation, we have a 40 centimeter near point convergence here. And then all of a sudden, you already had 250, a requirement of 250 in the distance, let's just say for an example, and now you need another plus 250 at near. This patient now all of a sudden needs a plus five to be able to see up close that could be very, very challenging. Uh, so you end up with patients that all of a sudden, I usually use the analogy like it hits them like a bag of bricks, that all of a sudden post 40, they start to notice that they don't see well anywhere, distance, near, or anything. This patient, if anybody, and I mean, there's a case to argue that every single one of these patients is eligible for a multifocal, but this patient will usually absolutely require multifocal because they're absolutely, um, you know, unable to do much without some type of correction, both distance and near. So why don't we take a look now at uh, how, we're gonna take a look at some examples of what we've just discussed, and we're gonna talk about what recommendations we can probably make. So I know this could feel a little bit repetitive compared to the slide we just did previously, but I like to show these concepts in a number of different ways. Uh, you know, we talk about, it's one thing to look at it in the sense of a diagram of the eye and what's going on in the optics, but we don't really deal in that way when it comes to dispensary. We look at prescriptions. So why don't we take a look at a few prescriptions here and take a look at what the what's going on and what the recommendations likely should be for these patients. And you're gonna notice that, and, and I wanna iterate, I'm not a huge fan of making a blanket recommendation one size fits all for every single patient because it really depends on lifestyle and it depends on on their visual needs based on on their work and and different activities that they do so don't get locked into you know a good example is locked into giving every single patient the recommendation of progressive lenses even though i know progressive lenses are often the most convenient choice and probably what the patient's actually looking for it is important as a professional to look at the situation and make good recommendations and just give options. So anyways, why don't we jump into the first one here, the emetropic eye. So here's a, an emetropic prescription where, you know, distance prescription is plano. I just wrote it both ways so that it's recognizable in both ways, um, but you still have the ad. So of course, uh, we know that the distance requirement is null. However, they still require a 225 addition. Now, what can you recommend for this patient? Well, this patient has likely never worn glasses in their lives. So let's write that down, never worn glasses. So the concept of putting them in a full-time progressive can be a little bit daunting. Now, I'm not saying that this isn't a good recommendation to put them progressive. It's just something you have to keep in mind. This patient can easily go on with zero distance correction, and they can also be given a pair of readers. Now, in some dispensaries, it might be out of fashion to sell people, you know, generic over-the-counter readers, and I think that's more of like 
a business decision. However, this person would do absolutely fine. I'm actually very much of the school of thought that as a professional, you should be giving the best recommendations. And I have no problems with telling somebody in this particular case that a few dollars spent on a pair of readers would absolutely be sufficient. Now, alternatively, you can put them in a progressive edition lens if that is something that's going to be more convenient. The advantages to this is that you can keep them on and you won't lose them. Uh, let's just write that, won't lose them. Um, and the other advantage is that in a progressive lens, you are going to get some intermediate correction and some near correction. So those are things that we haven't discussed yet to this point, but I think it's intuitive enough that you can kind of figure it out that every single working distance, we, we've used examples of about 40 centimeters, but everything behind that as well um, is also going to be out of focus when the ad gets a little bit higher here. Why don't we take a look at the myopic patient now? So this one is less of a straightforward answer here because there, again, are quite a few options. And you will find that many patients dislike the side effects of multifocal lenses. And in this particular case, I don't blame them sometimes. You know, you easily can get good vision uh, without. So first of all, we know they're myopic. And again, I haven't mentioned it yet, but we're looking at the primary refractive error here being the sphere power. The cylinder power contributes to that as well, right? We talked about this in our lecture about astigmatism. Uh, it's not being overlooked. It's just a matter of we're looking at what the overall visual experience is. So one great way of doing this is kind of thinking of a spherical equivalent. Um, in this particular case, the right eye, the spherical equivalent would be about a minus 225. And that quarter diopter cylinder is not really enough to consider. So let's just say for argument's sake, we're working in about a minus 225 OU. Well, the add power here is, is uh, plus 225. This intuitively you should look at this and say wow if i were to calculate a uh, reading prescription it would actually be essentially zero uh plano right so i mean of course you would carry over your cylinder but it's in the neighborhood so in this particular case you know that the myopic patient sees quite well up close let's say at 40 centimeters like we've been using as an example uh, however distance vision isn't great so i mean the overall visual acuity here for a patient that has this type of refractive air in the distance they likely would not be able to perform Perform, uh, distance tasks like driving, watching television, things like that without correction. So you know that they're, they're going to be wearing uh, their distance glasses. You're also going to know that when they look through their distance glasses, they cannot see well at all. Um, and I, I often like to discuss this with the patient before they even bring it up themselves. And this, you know, forms a certain sense of loyalty and trust when you already know what's going on with their vision before they tell you. Uh, you know that this patient, when they look through their glasses, are, are having a rough time. So what are your options? Well, option one is to just wear single vision distance glasses and then to remove them for near work. And I want to get this across that this is a viable option. I think that we get into this habit of just recommending progressives to everybody or, multi or like a line bifocal, which I know it's kind of falling out of fashion a little bit. However, what is wrong with removing your glasses? In, you know, in reality, this is kind of other than convenience, this is the better option. Essentially, you get, you know, an un, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Essentially, you get unimpeded vision uh, through a single vision lens design in both, well, not in both, but essentially in the distance and in unimpeded by lenses altogether up close. So I, I would strongly recommend that you discuss this option with your patients. Now, of course, it sometimes it falls apart when they say, well, I don't want to have to remove my glasses all the time. Uh, I want to be able to see the dash a little clearer. I want to be able to work at the computer with them and things like that. In that case, a progressive addition lens is definitely more appropriate. However, it does come with its, you know, negative effects, you know, some peripheral distortion, some adaptation time and things like that. So these two options are definitely something that are interchangeable depending on the circumstance. Now we look at the poor hyperope who all of a sudden has this negative experience of 
blurry distance vision and blurry near vision. So we see here that this patient is hyperopic. Um, spherical equivalent here is somewhere in the neighborhood of a plus 175 and a plus 225. Oops, 225. Uh, however, we know based on the previous slides that this person is now having a heart. This is enough to create blurry distance vision. And if we can if we add this to here now we're in the neighborhood of you know 450 for the left a four this is you know bad news in both near and distance so what do you do with this patient well single vision distance glasses is still an option but not a great one given the fact that even through their single vision distance they can't just remove them and see close uh, they need more power to see close so you can also create them a single vision reader however sometimes uh, this is going to be too strong for the computer you know a single vision reader will be adjusted to about 40 centimeters or 16 inches uh, you need less power to, for an intermediate so now you're talking about a single vision intermediate you're talking about three pairs of glasses so in this case this is the only case where i feel like a progressive lens or i mean you could do a flat top um, However, I know that this is being done less and less, but it is still a viable option. Uh, this is the only case where I feel like a progressive addition lens is a no-brainer. And it's just because not only of the convenience, but just you would, you know, it'd be very difficult to correct all the different focal lengths that this person needs to correct. So keep in mind that your hyperopic patient is definitely the one that's going to be most affected by presbyopia. And it's going to be the one that you're going to want to make the best recommendations for. Uh, because it can be a pretty frustrating experience for most of them and you know it goes a long way uh, for their comfort and to know that you understand what's happening and that you can correct it and here we are it never fails i try to aim for a shorter video and then we go 25 minutes plus um, however i think that this was important to go over all the different nuances of presbyopia and how it affects different patients who have different refractive errors and kind of some of the strategies that you can use especially to kind of you know think of what's going on and then it affects the recommendations you have so let's go over a little bit of a summary here uh, important to realize that presbyopia affects everyone even if you might run into some patients sometimes who say no no I'm fine I see well here and there it's still going on it's just you know some people have different experiences uh, and a lot of the time the myopes are the ones who feel relatively unaffected because they don't even clue into the fact that they're just removing their glasses to see up close. Always remember amplitude of accommodation. As life goes on, the ability for the eye to accommodate decreases, even in youth, right? So a 20 year old, uh, you know, young adult will not accommodate as well as a 10 year old child. And that continues to progress throughout life. Uh, these are things that we're gonna touch a little bit later in other lectures, because even like the 30 something crowd, they have a, a little bit of a unique situation where they start to lose accommodative ability. This is where a lot of products like anti-fatigue lenses and pre-presbyopic lenses, emerging presbyopic lenses have kind of become popular. Something we can discuss a little bit more into detail in another lecture. However, just remember that accommodation is always decreasing as time goes on. I wrote different strokes for different folks. Not every single patient is going to have the same experience when it comes to presbyopia. So we can't make any assumptions. Uh, well, actually, we can make some assumptions. However, we just have to be careful in understanding that we have to categorize you know, what type of refractive error they have first before we start assuming what their experience is going to be. Myopes may not have a negative experience. We just talked about it. You know, sometimes they don't realize that they're removing their glasses or maybe they're looking under their glasses to see. And for some of them, that's OK. And in those cases, I honestly think that, you know, a multifocal lens can sometimes be a tough sell because, uh, you know, the old adage goes, if it's not broken, why fix it? If they're seeing well with their single vision distance glasses uh, and then they just remove them to read and they haven't had any problems with that. It can, you know, they can be a little disappointed with uh, with the negative effects of a multifocal if you're the one pushing it. So be very careful about your recommendations. Solve problems. Don't assume problems and then create them by trying to solve something that was never there. So always remember that. Uh, but hyperopes, those are the ones that you really have to watch and 
nurture and help. Um, and I think this is one of the biggest overlooked things about presbyopia is the effect on hyperopic patients. And we see prescriptions, even prescriptions as low as like a plus 0.5, maybe a plus one. We just assume, ah, oh, these people are fine. However, that's not always the case when presbyopia hits, especially later in life in their 60s, and especially those who have had refractive surgery, who've had cataract surgery, and no longer have any accommodation, they're pseudophagic, and uh, their hyperopic correction at distance can be just as negative. I, should, that's, I shouldn't use the word negative. It could be, it could be just as um, unfriendly to them as a myopic correction. And if I'm going to tell you anything to kind of take from this, it's that you don't get caught into always making the same recommendations because you can get caught in a trap with this. I've alluded to it a few times. If you're trying to solve problems that people don't actually perceive that they have, I know, you know, for most of us, when we do things like this, it's with the right intentions in mind. However, it's not always perceived that way. Assess the situation figure out what these people are doing in order to help the situation in order to solve it on their own and then make recommendations accordingly don't assume that every single patient is best suited into a, a progressive lens or some type of multifocal discuss how their lives are going with what they're doing and then kind of figure out what the best solution is from there All right, and that concludes our presentation on presbyopia, another long one. However, these refractive error presentations are uh, super important as background. So in the future, we're going to be doing a little bit more calculation and different, uh, different concepts that may not take as long. And uh, I, I'd like that to be able to get through things a little bit quicker and kind of and move on to other concepts. However, I think that given the fact that refractive error is something we deal with every single day, it's extremely important to get kind of the, the, the a word I've been using a lot is nuances, things that are in the background that we don't always discuss. It's very important to be good at what we do and to really make the best recommendations for our patients. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Hope you enjoyed this week's presentation and don't forget if you have any questions about any of the stuff we cover in these videos, make sure to drop a comment down below and I'll make sure to answer. And always, always, always don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly content. I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye.